Let's have a word of prayer, and Brother Mike's going to come get that hymn book out for a little bit of singing. Father, I ask your blessing tonight on the service as we meet together. Thank you already for the boys and girls that are downstairs. I pray tonight as the word of God is open, as the missionary story is read. And Lord, they'd see the love of the teachers. They'd hear, uh, Lord, uh, what the Bible says about the truth they're learning. Lord, we pray even among the young people, you would work in their hearts about being a missionary. Lord, many a missionary biography has stated that they got their burden for missions by hearing missionary stories read in a Sunday school classroom or a children's church. Lord, I pray seeds be planted their hearts will be pricked lord i pray tonight you'd work in our hearts tonight as adults lord we may be weary from work may have been a long work week or even a long day there may be a lot bogging us down we may not feel great tonight but lord i pray tonight we'd lay those things aside you'd give us strength to listen to heed the word of god to be encouraged by brothers and sisters in christ lord encourage us even now as we sing this great hymn from the hymn book we ask these things in jesus name amen number 350 are you washed in the blood the first and the last Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? I'm the last. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Thank you. you may be seated. You know that first stanza, you were asked eight questions. Don't you have to answer the questions? All right. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's four questions. Then the chorus has four. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, you don't have to answer out loud, but I hope you can answer those. I hope you can remember the occasion when it was you trusted Christ as Savior. The verse that this song is based on, 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Aren't you glad it's all sin? Not some, or I hope most, or I'm not quite sure, or what if, I don't know. Nope, it was sufficient. Uh, it is finished. We we'll praise the Lord for that. I hope you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Well, we're going to open our Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 tonight is where we're going to be at. And again, good to have a few of our young people here. Continue to pray for Matthew Volpita there in the military. And we've got David heading off one more Sunday, I believe, right? And they're going to be headed off here pretty soon to head to college. Juliana got a little bit longer, but still coming up here in just a few weeks back to Maranatha. And so college students heading off. Keep them in your prayers both now and certainly at college, as well as everybody else in your church family. Now, there are a few new additions. Uh, uh, if you are a reader, I hope you are. Sometimes I'm a little bit amazed we're not, not that many in our church that seem to read these things. Now, you may get them by email, and if so, that's awesome, and maybe that's where you read them there. But uh, And these two here you might get. These are both uh, things that are put out by ministries that we support. All right, so the first one there is called the Shalom Chauffeur. You may get this shofar. Uh, Craig uh, Hartman there, uh, Shalom Ministries up in New York City. So if you're on his list, you may have already gotten this. If not, uh, look one of the places 
places where you keep uh, reading material for folks in the church. And this gives you a little bit of a highlight there, especially focusing on Jewish ministries and missions, uh, things in the world. That's important to know, certainly, uh, from that. All right. Second thing is the Keystone Sentinel, and that's KCEA, Ted Clater. And this was excellent. Just This was got a lot of good stuff. You say, well, I don't, I don't have any kids, and my kids don't go to Christian school, so I don't need it. No, no, a lot more than on there than that. So let me read you some of the titles. Stewardship, Wisdom Through Tax Decisions. All right. Pneumatic devices beyond ice cream, cake, and candles. What's that about? All right. Uh, I love the section in here on the Bible and society. This isn't one you need to read about. It's talking about a new Bible name. Of course, there's always Bibles coming out. Most of the time it's for profit. All right. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses have a one coming. It's called the Divine Name King James Bible, one that could fool people if you didn't know what it was about. I encourage you to read that article in there. All right. Apathy, a multifaceted snare to avoid. All right. Then it gives national notes in the back, things that deal with politics, Christianity. I hope you'll grab those. I make about 10 to 12 copies. Most of the time we throw away most of those or have to reuse them just for uh, writing on the back. So I encourage you to grab those. Uh, I think there's another one out there as well. Maybe we'll be coming. So take advantage of those. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. I've been praying about what the Lord would have now that we're in August and now we're sort of done with our major minor prophet study there. And at least for just two or three weeks, probably won't be for the whole month, I'm going to look at a topic that has to do with what's going on right now in the world. All right. And uh, let's see if you can figure that out there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Let's read the very end. And uh, last few verses, verses that were always close to my heart and sometimes even use these as like a, a life passage, uh, at least certain times in high school and college. Still love these verses here. First Corinthians chapter number nine. Let's read verses 24 to 27. 24 to 27. I wonder what Paul's referencing here when he's talking to believers. First Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Now, one of his great phrases he likes to use, if you're familiar with Paul's writing, especially in Corinthians, is, know ye not. Be a good little study for you. Know ye not. Go through and all the know ye nots. He's writing to Christians, believers. You don't know this? You should know this. This has been covered. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, any, man, any person that strives to be first, the mastery, I want to master the sport, I want to be the master, number one. Anyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate, disciplined in all things. Now they, those that are not believers, do it to obtain a corruptible crown or an award, but we, an incorruptible I therefore so run, not, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. All right. Well, no secret that we're in a little bit past halfway point of the 2024 Olympics. And whether you are watching, not watching, maybe you're turned off, made a decision because of the opening ceremony. That's certainly between you and the Lord. That's fine. All right. But 2024 Olympics, whether you love sports, athletics or not, whether you follow it or not, that's fine. I'm still going to use the illustrations here tonight. We're finishing up. It's got another week to go there. And you're watching. Maybe you're keeping up with that. Maybe you say, I have no interest or I'm turned off. That's certainly up to you. I, I, love, uh, I love athletics and I, I love uh, the, the history of athletics. So I, I always love the history of the Olympics. And one of my favorite books I have of all time, uh, it talks about the 100 greatest athletes of all time. And it's not talking about U.S. and I used to read all the time. And, and athletes from all over, not just the United States and, and any kind of anything from uh, you know, famous people, horse racing and uh, uh, to uh, you know, Pavo Nermi, uh, the great runner there from uh, Finland to Emil of Potak, all right, maybe names you're like, what are you talking about, all right, uh, from Czechoslovakia, I mean, just all kind of stuff, foot, you name it, I love those kind of, I love reading those kind of things, all right, going way back, and so I like to follow those kind of things, and it's pretty obvious here if you read through the Pauline epistles that if Paul either watched some of those games personally, certainly they were happening during his lifetime, and he certainly drew some illustrations uh, from those, no doubt, as a believer, no doubt looking for those spiritual truths, the Holy Spirit obviously includes some of this in the Word of God. 
Now, I don't know if you know a lot about the, the Olympics. Now, I, I, don't, uh, I can't say I've ever met anybody personally that was won a medal. And I have met somebody that was in the Olympics. All right. My, uh, believe it or not, now I'm a youth ministries major, youth ministries Bible from Pensacola. And my minor was P.E., and so I took a lot of PE classes. I, I think I probably took 10 over the years. Now, a lot of times today they've eliminated those. But, I mean, I took classes from bowling uh, to volleyball to track and field uh, to soccer to weightlifting. I can't even remember all of them, all right? Uh, to even, believe it or not, believe it or not, this could stun you, to gymnastics, all right? Now, gymnastics was required. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's not what you're watching on the Olympics, all right, uh, in any way. Uh, but uh, I had to take gymnastics, and so we took gymnastics from Coach Hayeswinkle. What a great name, Coach Hayeswinkle. Uh, Coach Hayeswinkle had a twin brother. Both of them were on staff at Pensacola when I was there. They're both retired now. Both the Hayeswinkle brothers, identical twins, were in the Olympics. Uh, they were in the Olympics for wrestling, I believe Greco-Roman, and I believe they were in like the 68 right, Olympics and the 72 Olympics, at least two of them. And by the way, they have a great book uh, out that was given, I got it for Christmas, and uh, it's taken back their history, how they came to know the Lord, how they've been able to give the gospel out. But both of the brothers were in two Olympics, they made the Olympic teams and were Olympic wrestlers, and so Coach Hayeswinkle did some PE classes, and they had, re they had a wrestling program at Pensacola for several years. Now, they didn't wrestle uh, like Division One, but they, they, they wrestled some pretty good universities. We used to go to watch them in the gym, had some good guys. So Coach Hayeswinkle, very short. You can see the cauliflower ears if you know what wrestling is. And, uh, but I love that class. He, he, we had like the first week or two uh, was on Olympic history and gymnastics history. Man, I was just eating it up. He was telling us all kinds of stuff. And you get pumped up. You want to wrestle. You want to do And so all we did gymnastically was we did some of the parallel bars and we just did floor stuff. All right. So no, no, nothing fancy. All right. Believe me. All right. But uh, that, was, that was all we did. But uh, learned some neat things. But I remember him talking about being in the Olympics. I remember how him and his brother used to share Christ. And by the way, I can't remember the name of the book. Uh, Dwight Smith will be coming for our men's retreat. Uh, grew up in Minnesota and I think knows the Hayeswinkles. But you can find it. It's, I've seen it on social media. Uh, I've seen it on the Pensacola website. Excellent book there. Uh, I could bring it in and let you borrow it. But uh, he, I remember him telling us the history of it, all right? Many of you know this. So the ancient Olympics started obviously there in Olympics, sometimes Athens, Olympic Greece. 17, 776 B.C., to about A.D. 393. So for about a thousand years, what we would call the ancient Olympics were held. All right, so now how do we tie that in with the, uh, with the Bible? Well, 776 B.C., 776 B.C., all right? So that's, that's around the time the book of Isaiah would have been written. Isaiah is basically, we say, around 700, King Uzziah, all right? Uh, Malachi that we finished is believed to have been a prophet around 440, 400 and then we have the silent years we just finished. So the Olympics were being held during those times the whole way through. And then even when Greece was conquered and the Romans took over, even during the life of Christ and even up into the 393 A.D., all right, about a thousand years or so of what we would call the ancient Olympics. Now, if you know anything about that, it was only for Greeks. It was only for freeborn Greek citizens, and they were for men only. All right, and you had to be a citizen, you had to be pure-blooded, and you had to be a man, and you were eligible in that. Some of the things they still do today were done back then. Running, long jump, shot put, spear, javelin throwing, boxing, wrestling, archery, discus, some of the equestrian chariot racing, all right, and the only award you got, well, there was no second and third, it was one. One receives the prize, one. No gold medals, the olive wreath olive wreath placed on the head signifying you are the champion. That olive wreath was obviously corruptible, right? Corruptible. It wasn't going to last, all right? But that's what they did, all right? Typically, they were held on a four-year cycle with the biggest being held in Olympus, Greece. Olympus, Greece. But there were other games held every year. So for all four years, there were games, probably the one that people believe Paul either personally attended or watched would have been the Isthmus Games, which were held in Corinth. Held in Corinth. Go back and read Acts, see how long Paul was in Corinth and what he traveled in and around Greece, all right? So that was the ancient games. Now they ceased then, and for over a thousand years they weren't held. And then about 1896, the modern Olympics as we know them were restarted by a Frenchman 
in Paris, France. Obviously, today, this year, they're in Paris, France. So they've been going on for 128 years. You say, where are you going with this? Well, I'm going to get to, we're going to get to this for a purpose, all right? The very first modern Olympics in 1896, there were only 14 nations, 241 athletes, and there were 43 events. A recent gold medal sold from the 1896 Olympics, not as much as you may think, but sold for $88,000. Say, hey, I have a gold medal from the very first modern Olympics, all right? Today's gold medals are worth about 950 if you saw one of them on TV. They're not even worth 1000 They're not pure gold, obviously, all right? Now, I don't know the statistics for this year's Olympics, but in 2020, when they had the Olympics, there were 206 nations, 11,300 athletes, and 339 different events. I believe this year, America had over 500 athletes just representing our country, all right? You say, well, where are you going with all of this? Well, I think there's some important truths. We're going to see that Paul often referenced running a race, pressing for the prize, receiving a crown, looking and watching and paralleling that to uh, spiritual striving. I love the stories of the Olympics. I love especially if they involve Christians. And I don't just use that word loosely, all right? So just because on social media someone says so-and-so, they're a Christian, I don't know about that. I'm not God, but I like those that maybe. So let me just tell you about two or three that are some of my favorite Olympians from years ago. And if you have children or grandchildren, it'd be great for you to introduce these. These would be people that could be earthly heroes, not necessarily some of the ones that are always promoted today. But the 1924 Olympics, 100 years ago, held in Paris. Eric Liddell. Sometimes we say Lytle, Liddell, Little, nobody knows how his name is, Scotsman. Hopefully you've heard about him. All right? He's called the Flying Scotsman from Scotland. All right? Eric Liddell. And uh, he won the gold in the 400 meters, the bronze in the 200 meters. Famous for what? Being really one of the world record holders in the 100, the shortest, fastest race. But he refused to run because the heats were on Sunday. He had a strong conviction as a Christian. He would not do any, anything on Sunday. And so he refused to run, even for the Olympics. That was his best race. That was the one he was expected to win. He got a lot of heat from that. A lot of people from America, even fellow Olympians, couldn't believe it. Come on, Eric. He said, no. He stuck by his convictions. He therefore ran two events that were not his best. The 200, he got the bronze. And the 400, he rarely ever raced. One time around the thing. But he won the gold medal in the 400. Many of you may hopefully know the story of a man handing him a little slip of paper right as he got ready to run. And on it was a little verse, 1 Samuel 2.30. Paraphrase, he that honors me, I will honor him. All right, put it in his pocket, ran the 400, won the gold medal. National hero. Did he go back to any more Olympics? He didn't. Why? He wanted to be a missionary. He turned down all the fame and all the fortune. Uh, he was born in China as a missionary kid. He went back to China as a missionary, served the Lord, was put in a prisoner of war camp because if you were an Englishman or anybody that wasn't during the war, he wasn't a, in a soldier, but he was put in a prisoner of war camp in Japan, China, and died in the prisoner of war camp at age 43. All right? If you read his biography, which I highly recommend, he was still extremely fast. They even held some games in China, and they knew who he was, and he ran, and he still beat people, even after really not being a full-time athlete. And what a testimony he had for the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've heard his famous saying, I won't try to say it in Scottish, all right? God may be fast. <laughs> He said, God made me fast, all right? And they said, why, why are you? He said, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his presence. I want to run for his honor and his glory. It gave him opportunities. He spoke to a lot of young people, a lot of children, a lot of teens, uh, using what he did for the glory of the Lord. And uh, Eric Liddell, what a great Olympic athlete that turned down what a lot of people today would do so he could serve the Lord, sharing the gospel in another country. What about 1936 Olympics? Those are famous for Jesse Owens. I don't know if Jesse Owens was a Christian. Jesse Owens, a black American that won the four gold medals uh, during, held in Berlin with Hitler, all right, before World War II. But there were two other men there that were, I hope you know more about. One is Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini, of course, Hollywood made a movie of him recently. Unfortunately, it was a Hollywood version. Didn't give the spiritual side of him. And, uh, but if you've ever read Louis Zamperini's biography, Louis Zamperini, would have, he would have fit in around here. I believe he was an Italian-American. And uh, that name there got in a lot of trouble. But he loved to run. He actually made the Olympic team at age 19. 
All right, one of the youngest Olympians. Same, same Olympic team as Jesse Owens, all right. Got to go to Berlin and ran the 5,000 meters, all right. Got eighth place as a 19-year-old. It was so hot, all right. But he was so well-known, he ran the very final lap in 56 seconds, which was one of the fastest of all time, so that even Hitler said, shook his hand and said, ah, oh, you're the young man that ran so fast, all right. If you ever read his biography, uh, he actually got in big trouble because they stole a flag and then got arrested by the uh, Germans and he got out of it and all of that kind of stuff. But he was not a believer. He went into the war. He was a prisoner of war. He was out in the sea forever, prisoner of war. I hope, you, I hope you've heard about him, all right. Uh, tortured tremendously, got out of the war, was a drunkard came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through an evangelist there in Los Angeles, went on to serve the Lord for many years, preaching teenager. just died a few years ago at age 97, 2014. What a great story, Louis Zamperini. There's one other person, though, part of the American team. I hope you know who he is, Glenn Cunningham, all right? Used to be one of my favorite books as a boy. Glenn Cunningham. Glenn Cunningham was one of the fastest milers in the entire world. He got the silver, though. He didn't win the gold. Great Christian. I hope you read his biography. A lot of people today never heard about him. All right. Well-known story, though, but uh, him and his brother uh, were in a bad one-room schoolhouse fire. When he was eight and his brother was 13, his brother died. Uh, Glenn was severely burned, and the doctors wanted to amputate his legs at age eight. His parents said no. Doctors said he'll never walk, ever. Well, if you've never read this book, I mean, encourage you to get it, all right? Glenn Cunningham, great Christian man, uh, was determined even as a boy, and, and he began. He began to learn to walk. He began to run. He began to run. He began to run everywhere he could go. He became the fastest man in the world. He became the, one of the greatest runners of all time. He was even voted the most popular U.S. athlete by his fellow Olympians at the 1936 Olympics, all right? His favorite verse, Isaiah 40, 31. Him and his wife started a Christian youth ranch in Kansas, how many people know about some of these great Christians, you know? I want to encourage you. If you don't know anything about some of the great Christians that we have testimony of, uh, let me encourage you to read about them. Hey, you say, well, for many of them, they did it not for uh, fame and fortune. They weren't here to get money. Uh, God gave them a talent. They used it. To, they weren't necessarily interested in trying to promote themselves. Many went on and rejected a lot of the things of the Lord of the world to, to serve the Lord. Why? Knowing what we're reading right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Know ye not... Christian, fellow Christian, it says, don't you understand and know that they which run in a race run all. And my favorite, I, I love track and field. That's some of my favorite. I love the, uh, I love the underdog coming. And there's been three great races already, if you've been watching, to where there's been huge, huge upsets. All right. One was the 4 by 400 The American team just broke the record. And, boy, that, nut, that Dutch girl came out of nowhere and won it. I mean, from way back. All right. And then if you watch the, the American that just won the 1500 my goodness. All right. Just came out of nowhere and stunned everybody and won the gold. The top guys didn't even win. And then just, uh, just today, the guy at 400 uh, came out of nowhere. They thought he was – and he passed everybody. All right. Like, man, that's awesome. All right. And we sometimes will glory them and say, oh, look at them up there, the national anthem, the, the, the gold medal. Isn't that incredible? All right, but the point is this. Know ye not, believers, that they which run in a race run all. You're running to win. You're running to strive to win. You want to be first. But only one receives the ultimate prize. Obviously, at the time of Paul, there would have been only one prize. There's no second, no third. There's one winner. So run, Christian, that ye may obtain. Now, Paul is using the Olympic Games or games like that to teach spiritual truth. And obviously the Holy Spirit is using it. He's the author of the Bible. So it says, Christians, fellow believers. Now let's see if we can learn any truths it says from this. Verse 25, every man, or we could say every person, every athlete, if we want to use this, that strives for the mastery. Now, we took another senior trip when we were... Uh, teaching in the Christian school, we took our seniors to Denver, Colorado for a week senior trip. And one day we went down to Colorado Springs for the day, great, great place. And we went to the Olympic training site, one of the Olympic training sites in America. And that was awesome. Uh, Michael Phelps happened to be there. Now, we didn't get to see him. This was, uh, this was been at his heyday. Michael Phelps was there swimming, but we didn't get to see him. Although a couple of the seniors in our class got to talk to some Olympians that were 
weightlifting and working with the weights. They were getting ready for the Olympics. And so that was pretty neat, walking around the site, looking at things and uh, asking some questions about how these folks train. Normally we see them on TV or we see them on a commercial. And we're like, wow, that's awesome. You know, look at that, 45 seconds. They want, that was easy. I could do that. Or <laughs> 100 meter, I mean 9.5, but come on, all right, and yet when you talk to, I remember some of the, some of them were talking to some of the uh, weightlifters that were working there, and, what, and they would, hey, I mean, for most of them, the Olympics is, is it, you know, amateur, uh, sometimes the professionals today, but for the, the smaller ones that aren't that important, and maybe there's not as many meets, you're training for four years, Yes, there's world championships and smaller meets, but you're training for four years. And though we might see the people swimming, Katie Ledecky and such, uh, most of them, if you ask them there, I believe they said they normally swim eight to nine hours a day. Now, most of us aren't doing that. We're not going to do that. <laughs> every day, every day. No, and they're not eating pizza, and they're not drinking soda, and they're not staying up late. And I, I, I like to read about some of the runners. A lot of the runners, I mean, they're in bed by eight or nine o'clock. I mean, come on, some of us, our day's just starting. Woo, stay up late. All right. And they're not doing a lot of those things. They're not going out hanging with everybody. I mean, they are deadlocked in. They are focused in. They say, you know what? I'm going to have to say no to some things in order to try to win the ultimate prize. And that's what it's saying here in verse 26, 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery. You know, we get that word strive. You know what that word is there? That's that Greek word agonizo. Does that sound familiar? Agonizo. Agonize. <laughs> Agonize. Oh, I don't want to do sit-ups. I don't do a push. I don't want to run. I don't want to do weights. I don't want to. Uh, it's agony. It's hard work, sore muscles. I don't want to have to go up hills. I don't want to have to lift weights. Uh, I don't want to have to do that stuff. Agony. You say, I can't believe they push themselves. I can't believe they do all those kind of things. I, I remember years ago reading about uh, Walter Payton, a great runner there from the Bears, and some of the, how he trained. Most of us would never be able to make it one day, all right, run in the hills in the heat, all right? I mean, just every day, you're like, oh, man, I, I, that look, it looks easy on TV, all right? And sometimes we'll emulate those people. But the Bible is saying here, look, if you're going to strive for the masteries, if you're going to agonize, if you're going to do all that you need to do there and pay the price, you're going to contend and labor. That word strive is the same word we looked at repeatedly in the book of Jude, to contend for the faith. That's the word agonize. Whoever does that is temperate. That's self-disciplined in all things. Boy, no, I'm not going to stay up late. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to train. I'm going to have a dedicated diet. I'm not going to eat all the foods that I may. I'm going to eat stuff I may not like. I'm going to train. i got a trainer that's making me do it again and again and again and again and again. What, for what purpose? Just so we can win. You say, wow, everybody understands that that's how it works there. Now they do it. Paul brings the emphasis here. Now those at the Olympiad... Those that we see on TV, they might be doing it just for a corruptible crown. Hey, first place, NBA champion, uh, a major league World Series champion, gold medal. Look at me. Woo! But that's temporary. The, the olive wreath's going to fade. The gold medal may get passed down to family, children. Maybe somebody, eh, we're just going to sell this. We need money. It gets lost. Nobody knows what happened to it. It's corruptible. It's temporary. But Paul says, we believers... We should be pursuing something far greater than that, an incorruptible crown, something that fades not away. Now, Paul gives his own personal, Paul, how do you train? Now, by the way, you say, well, why are we reading this? This comes at the end of a chapter that's sometimes very much misunderstood and certainly misinterpreted. It's Paul basically sharing about how he reaches people with the gospel's sake. Paul saying, I will do Sometimes people will misconstrue what he says here. I'll do this and this in order to reach people for the gospel. Paul's not... Friend, let me just read some of that because I've heard this used a lot of times very much out of context. Verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God. Verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Verse 23, and this I do, not for a gold medal, but for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. If you've been with us in adult Sunday school class, we already know what Paul went through and what he was going to go through, what he was prepared to go through for the gospel. 
Paul is not in any way saying, I'll just I'll compromise. Hey, if I got to go in the bars to win people to Christ, I'll go to bars. If I got to get tattoos, I'll get tattoos. If I got to drink, no, no. Paul's not saying any of that because he, he makes it clear here in verse 25 every man that strives for the mastery is tempered in all things. And we read other scriptures here, it's according to the laws and the rules. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to reach people with the gospel's sake. That's for the incorruptible crown. And Paul says, here's my self-discipline, verse 26. Paul uses two athletic events, running and boxing. I therefore so run. I'm running the race. How's he run, Paul? Not as uncertainly. It means I have a purpose. I, I have a goal in mind. I'm not just out there, oh, I'm just running. What, what, what time are you trying? I'm not really trying to get a time. Well, where are you in, where's the end line? I don't know. I have no end line. What are you doing? You're just, what's the point then? You've got no purpose. Paul said, that's not how I'm running. I'm running, certainly. I'm running with a focus and a goal. How do you fight, Paul? We're talking about the spiritual fight. How do, you, how do you wrestle? How do you box? He says, not as one that beateth the air. The idea there is, you know, the boxer, shadow boxing. You see when they're warming up, boom, 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 boom. You know, guys are doing this. Sometimes kids are doing this. Boom, boom. That's called shadow boxing. Oh, there's no real point to that. There's no real. He said, I'm not just doing it beating the air. I'm not just going through the motions. Verse 27, but I keep under my body. That's personal self-discipline. The physical pleasures and physical appetites, the things I may want to do, I'm, I'm the master of it with the Lord's help. That doesn't master me. Well, you know, I'm too, ah, it's hard to get up for church. You know, I just, uh, reading the Bible's tough. I just can't stay focused on the Word of God. You know, I, I daydream. I read different things. I, I just, oh, my God. A lot, of a lot of lazy, undisciplined believers. I can include myself in their times. I just, you know, well, how, can, how come, I, you know, I, I just, I forgot. Or I just, hey, well, we're, we're human. We're fleshly. We, we make mistakes. But a lot of times we're not successfully running the race and, because we're undisciplined in a lot of areas. And Paul is saying, hey, I keep under my body. I'm the master of it. If you've ever, you ever done any kind of major physical exercise, right? I mean, what do you see at yard sales all the time? <laughs> Treadmills, rowing machines, the latest sit-up thing. People buy them. They get psyched up at Christmas and birthday. do all this stuff. And well, you're going to find out. It takes work. It takes discipline. And you've got to stick with it. Uh, yeah. Don't sell it. Get rid of it. You know, memberships always spike in January. They always go up in January. All right, yeah, come on. Here we go. Yeah, but how long do you last? How long are you willing to do that? You willing to get up early? You willing to get uh, not, uh, I don't know about it. It takes discipline. Absolutely. And only those who are the greatest discipline succeed. You know, we see, we see the guys shooting NBA. And we're like, oh, this is awesome. Go out in the backyard. Yeah, well, you didn't watch them shooting 500 shots. Before and after practice. You, you don't want, we don't watch that kind of stuff. And all the things they say no to. Whoa. Paul says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest, now Paul says, here's what I do. I'm, I say no to things that may not even be sinful. They're not best. That's usually the battle for believers. You've heard that said. That's not me that came up with it. It's not, the choice is not between what's good and bad for most Christians. It's between what's good and what's best. Most of us, unless we're a young Christian, know what's good and bad based on the Bible. This is good, this is bad. The choice is, this is okay, but this is best for me. This is the best. I've got to choose the best. This is what God desires. Paul's saying here like a runner, hey, when you go out running, you know what wants to tell you to stop? This one and this one. Stop. You're dying. <laughs> Quit. Walk. No, there's no sin in walking. Everybody knows that the moment you stop and walk, you're more prone to always walk. And so you have to power through that. Everybody, runner knows there's a runner. There, there's the runner's hill, the hill where it breaks you. There's a halfway point in the race. There's a point where you're just saying, stop, stop. And, and the key is this, you've got to know when to push on. That's why when you watch running, I love it. But boy, who could, who's, how can they go that fast at the end? You know that every part of their body is screaming, stop. You know they're barely breathing. You know their legs are pounding. You know they don't think they can run any longer. And then they, ah, and, they and then they, what, they collapse half time. <laughs> Just die, oh my goodness, whoa. That person mastered their body, though it was telling them, stop, stop, stop. Paul's saying, spiritually, I've got a purpose and I've got a goal. 
And I'm not just out there, well, let's see what's going to happen today. Boom, I've got goals. This one thing I do, I press toward the mark. Paul said, I'm, I'm, you know, a lot of times we say, whoa, I can never be like that person. I can never be like a David Livingston. I can, well, we could be. We, we could be. They're, they're the same DNA we have. Usually comes down to discipline. Usually comes down to desire. Ability to love the Lord. What am I going to be willing to say no to for the sake of Christ? What, what is tempting me that, no, it's not that bad, and it leads me astray? What, what is causing me to be weak? Paul says, I keep under my body spiritually. I bring it under subjection. It doesn't run me. I run it with the help of the Lord. What's Paul's motivation? Look at the end here as we wrap it up. Wow, what a motivation. So that I can be better than Barnabas. So I can brag over Silas. Absolutely. And Paul said, None of the, I don't compete against the others. lest that when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, Here, here's my motivation. Here's why I do what I do. Here's why I suffer for the cause of Christ. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. I can do all things through Christ. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm willing to whatever, oh, for the sake of the gospel, none of these things move me. I am not ashamed. Whoa, I could never be Paul. Why, Paul? Because of the judgment seat of Christ. Because I'm going to stand before the Lord. I'm going to give an account. I'm not giving an account for Barnabas or Silas or my parents or my brothers or my sisters or my church members. I'm going to give an account for me before the one who died for me. And so I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to be a castaway. Now, some people will misconstrue this portion of Scripture and really pull it out and try to say it's talking about losing your salvation, which we know is ridiculous because Paul's writing to believers at Corinth, and he's saying to you, believer, don't you know this? You're already a citizen. You can't lose your salvation. We're talking about reward. That's one of the major themes of the New Testament. We're talking about reward from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking, you can't lose salvation you didn't do anything to gain it. We're talking about the area of reward. I don't want to stand before the Lord and be a castaway. That word castaway here is an interesting word. It means disapproved, disqualified. Comes right out of the Olympic Games. I don't want to be found disqualified. There are rules and conditions. The fields have out of bounds. Uh, wrestling and different bodies, they have weights. You've got to meet the weight criteria. You're disqualified. Uh, there, there's certain things, long jump, triple jump. You've got to, there's a mark. If, I mean, if I, I could break the world record, and they, slow motion, I'm, oh my goodness, one, one, eighth, my foot was over the, doesn't count. Completely disqualified. I know, but it was just that, nope. Too bad. There are rules and regulations. There are officials that are watching. Paul says, lest that by any means when it's all finished. And I stand before the Lord. And I give an account of what I did. I don't want to be a disapproved, disqualified. Loss of reward. I don't want to see that. I don't lose any citizenship. My citizenship is in Jesus Christ. The idea there is I might have to stand to the side and receive no reward. We've seen that repeatedly. We've seen that in the book of 2 John. Take heed, you lose not that reward. We've seen that all through the scriptures. All right, Especially in the Pauline and the church things here. Uh, what we're looking at right here. We need to strive lawfully according to the laws and the rules. We need to strive biblically according to the word of God. I'll finish with this. This didn't happen in the Olympics, but maybe you can tell. I, I like a lot of athletic history. 1980, Boston Marathon. Most prestigious marathon in America. Maybe you know the name, Rosie Ruiz. Rosie! A woman won the Boston Marathon. She received the accolades. woo -hoo! Yeah, but eight days later, Rosie was stripped of her championship. As they investigated and found out, Rosie did not run the marathon. <laughs> she joined the race about a half a mile from the end. She had never run it. She had just slipped out of the crowd, came in. Now, this is days today. You can't get away with that probably with cameras and security and stuff. But back in those days, it wasn't as close to the garden. And here's the lady. She just came right out and just... And just Ran right to the end, woohoo! Got the accolades, got the award, Boston Marathon winner. 
But when they finally, when there was some concern, people said, I don't remember ever seeing her. I'm not sure she was even racing. She wasn't up there with any of the people. Where did she come from? And when they began to investigate a week later, they stripped it from her. And we know that name today, not as a winner, but as one who broke the rules. One who didn't strive lawfully. Not according to the laws and the rules that were set up for the race. You know, there's a lot of believers today. We're doing a lot of work. I mean, think about it. We can run, 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 but if it's not according to the word of God, if it's not according to what God has clearly revealed for how he wants his children to do it there, we can lose reward. Disqualified. Absolutely. We must do things the Lord's way with joy. Well, many of us know those final verses that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 4, probably right out of the Olympics. I have fought a good fight. The idea there is boxing and wrestling. I have finished my course. The race is done. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, notice, the righteous, remember, Paul would have went to Olympic Games, and guess who was the empire? The Romans, not known for being righteous, not known for judges who were necessarily always honest. Paul says, one day, I'm going to stand before the Lord, the righteous judge. We might say, hey, that's not fair, that person. Oh, come on, the judge was, he was, ah. But one day it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ who knows everything. He knows motive. And I, the righteous judge will give me that reward at that day. And not to me only. Isn't that a blessing? Don't you love that phrase? Well, that's probably just going to be Paul and Peter. No, 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 no. Not to me only. But unto all them, all believers that love his appearing. The idea there is love, have loved, and continue to love the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ and keep that in their forefront and all that they do. I want to spend some time over the next few weeks looking at some of the crowns that the believer can win. And it's not wrong to want to achieve those. All right. Paul, P, Jesus says it repeatedly to the seven churches. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Hold fast that you lose not your reward. So if anybody has issue with that, you've got issue with the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? Uh, absolutely. Be faithful, hold fast, stand before him. Receive some crowns for faithful service with faithful motive for the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll take a look at some of the crowns the Bible talks about in the scriptures. What was Paul's one goal? To glorify the Lord by winning the lost and building up the saints. Paul said, any cost, any price even if I have to give up my own personal rights. I will do that for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. All right, may you and I be willing to live for eternity, be willing to have what the Lord would call faithful striving till he comes. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. Lord, I pray our heroes are Christian men and women with strong, clear testimonies for you. Lord, we know our ultimate example is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it is a blessing to see fellow believers who are just like us, sinners made of clay, who, Lord, succeed, at least in this earth, Lord, with the honor and glory of the Lord. We're thankful for the good testimonies of men and women who've gone before us that we can learn from and study. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, not on the other runners and racers, Lord, not necessarily on the conditions around us, but to keep our eyes on you and the prize, to strive lawfully and biblically according to the word of God, to know the rule book, to know what pleases you, to know what displeases you. Lord, to honor and glorify you by the service and the spirit in which we do that. Lord, to not quit when we get tired. Lord, to not be weary in well-doing. Lord, knowing that we can receive the crowns from you. And Lord, that could be today. We might stand before you today. We don't have no idea. Lord, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for those that are running successfully and faithfully. And I pray young and old here today, Lord, would be citizens of heaven, on the Lord's team, striving for the sake of the gospel, at Lord, putting aside things that weigh us down, making sure that we're striving for incorruptible crowns, not earthly temporary ones that rust and corrupt. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.